early in this town. It wasn't the case when I was a student here. Um, looking around the room, I'm reminded of what uh, Dan Gilmore used to say all the time uh, when he was at the San Jose Mercury News, which is, he said, my readers know more than I do. So this is going to be a very interactive uh, session, looking around the room, seeing a lot of people who know more than I do. So I have a bunch of slides here. Don't bother to take notes. Anybody who wants these slides will email them to you. So uh, uh, you can uh, uh, continue eating and uh, not get your uh, pens and pencils uh, all messed up with problems from rolls and uh, other goodies. Um, our text this morning is going to be from Malcolm Gladwell, The Wisdom of Spaghetti Sauce. And it sort of goes along with breakfast. Well, not spaghetti and breakfast, but you know, the whole point of food and news both being essential. Malcolm Gladwell gave this great talk. Just Google this phrase, the wisdom of spaghetti sauce, and the first thing that comes up is going to be his lecture at TED a few years ago, where he talks about spaghetti sauce as a metaphor for what people want and what people prefer. And his point is that at one point, ragu was the dominant brand. Uh, some of us will remember that song. So, um, and along came uh, another company that wanted to take on ragu, and they did this market research to try to figure out how do we take on ragu. And they discovered that people didn't want one alternative to ragu. They didn't even want one ragu. They wanted lots of different spaghetti sauces. So Prego introduced lots of different spaghetti sauces. And the economics were quite simple. That you had a basic, you had your tomatoes, you had your onions. And so you had one vat, you have a few more tomatoes. And over here, you have a few more onions. And over here, you have a little more spicy uh, things. So you wind up with four or five different kinds of spaghetti sauce. And Prego wound up. Uh, with a lot of passionate following of these different types of, of sauces. So, what happened? Well, ragu was overwhelmed. So, again, minimal incremental cost and significant incremental revenue. So, looking around to see who was doing local news successfully in a splintering environment, uh, the wisdom of spaghetti sauce uh, kept coming back. Uh, over the last three years since the first edition of the book came out. And you, know, you can do the math and see how it, how it works. And this is more than just zone editions, more than just uh, uh, creating, uh, uh, where's our heat salt? Uh, creating uh, uh, different uh, uh, zones for cable news. Uh, this is uh, taking advantage of all of these uh, different platforms and different opportunities to uh, localize and customize news, but with small incremental increases in cost. So you have Brand extension works for spaghetti sauce, works for paper towels. Look at what Bounty is doing. They have, what, six different kinds of Bounty now in the store? Uh, and uh, it seems to be working for uh, journalism. It definitely works for digital journalism. So if you are an incumbent, if you uh, are a newspaper, if you are a radio station, television station, well-known website, you have an advantage because you can build on your existing brand. You have a promotional advantage. Uh, if you uh, look at what uh, Pierre Bouvard at uh, Arbitron said, 32% of online listeners discover online radio stations from on-air station mentions. And I know there's some people here I used to work with at CBS uh, uh, some time back. Uh, CBS News President Richard Salams in the 60s and 70s used to say, the best promotion <coughs> of is our own air. So you can build on existing content. You can uh, extend it to other platforms. And now we have Facebook and social media. There are some very, very interesting uses of Facebook uh, that have come up. Uh, if any of you have friended Donald Graham, he does some very interesting, uh, uh, he, he sends out links to some very interesting stories, most in the Washington Post, but not all. And some very interesting ways of extending, uh, extending uh, uh, the, the brand, as it were, building, uh, uh, building uh, uh, awareness. Um, twice as many people. Uh, use Facebook as Google. That's sort of a startling, uh, startling number. Um, we all remember that across the river here, uh, 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 in uh, this part of the country, a guy named Nick Negropani used to talk about the Daily Lee, that would be a tailored newspaper that would be printed out in a printer or a, uh, in your bedroom or in your bathroom or someplace every morning with just what you wanted. And uh, that's not quite what we have. Instead, uh, we go online and we have uh, something, uh, uh, something that approaches that. But it's, it's, it's uh, uh, somewhat different from a uh, mixed concept. Now what we have through social media is really sort of a daily us. You know, I log on in the morning and I'm getting all kinds of things from, uh, from Burford, from my son, from, uh, uh, from a number of people in the room who uh, 
have uh, sent me uh, uh, links and articles and uh, videos, and uh, not all of them are jokes. Um, <laughs> but if you're familiar with the 2006 edition of the books, one of the case studies is Monocle Radio, and uh, particularly radio, uh, radio station in Washington, D.C., and KSL uh, television and radio in Salt Lake. Uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, look at Washington, D.C., because some interesting things have happened there. Uh, WTOP, long time, traditional AM to the commercial uh, all news station. Uh, just uh, like WIMS, uh, uh, KMX, uh, KFWB, it's a fairly standard format. Uh, and it had a fairly standard audience, large, uh, skewing old, um, uh, and skewing male. Because the signal for WTOP AM didn't go to the west of Washington, where the population growth is taking place out by Dulles Airport, uh, Monocle won FM and uh, to cover that western part of Washington, the Washington, D.C. area. And with the identical programming, they have an audience which is 10 years younger. Same programming on FM. So Jim Farley, who I know a lot of you know, uh, uh, who runs uh, TOP, or I think he's a senior vice president now at uh, Monocle, he said, Gee, that's interesting. We have the same programming, but we're getting an audience 10 years younger. Uh, hmm, how did that happen? Uh, it turns out that uh, a, a lot of young people never tuned to the AM band. But one day there was a snowstorm. And those of you who are in the all news business know that snowstorms, during the rating period, you say, please, please, snow, please. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is guaranteed to uh, uh, boost your audience. So one morning in a snowstorm, uh, um, Farley tells us a story. He was in the newsroom feeling pretty good, they had the school closings up, they had the road closings up, they had office closings up, um, and then they started to get phone calls. Why isn't this on the internet? Well, it is on the internet, it's on our website. No, 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 why isn't WTOP on the internet? We can't hear it on the internet. We, you know, we're in a place where, uh, such as an office, where we can't get your signal. So they started to put it online. It was first it was WTOPnews.com, now it's WTOP.com, streaming the same content which the conventional wisdom in the business was skews old, skews male. So TOP FM, uh, they picked up all these listeners in their 40s. TOP.com, they picked up all these listeners in their 30s and even 20s with the same content. And they know exactly how many listeners they have online because, as you know, they know how many streams they're serving up. Uh, so what happened next? WTOP 1500 is gone. They shut it down out more about that later because they took the signal, uh, the, the programming from COP AM and they put it on the strongest FM station they had, which used to be a classical uh, uh, music station in Washington. They gave their music collection to the public radio station, which is now all classical, uh, a public radio station, WIGA, is now all classical, um, and they converted uh, 103.5 to all news. It is now, uh, by a significant margin, the number one station in Washington, D.C. <coughs> now, WTOP.com is sold in combo with the FM station. Fascinating. Uh, and I'll get up here. There's more. Back in uh, 2006, uh, in the uh, first edition of the book, I talked about federalnewsradio.com. And again, there's all these brainstorms saying, wait a minute, we have this all news service. And what if we take some slices of it? And instead of doing local news in those slices, we do news of interest to people in a certain micro-local category, which is federal office workers. Now, in Washington, that's a lot of people. And so they have this uh, other service called federalnewsradio.com streaming on the internet. And it's really, it's sort of funny if you listen to it because you can hear, uh, uh, they have this feature, it's like you know, the old Charles Corrales on the road, uh, except it's a guy who goes to different federal agencies and says, hey, I'm over in the federal department of the and they're having a good time here. Let's find out uh, what the they do in this agency. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they have things like you know, changes to your federal health insurance plan, changes to your retirement benefits. And so what's happened? Uh, even before they launched, uh, as you can see, they pre-sold it. And it was profitable literally the day they launched. And they bought a, an AM radio station to flip the signal, uh, the internet stream, over the air. And so now, 10.50 a.m. Uh, shows up in the ratings, gets a pretty decent audience. Uh, and what happened next? They moved it to 1500, the old WCOP uh, uh, a.m. Uh, uh, frequency. They now get, now these don't look like
like huge numbers if you're a, a major market, but think of who those people are who are listening to WFEV. It's 77,000 people, including two-thirds of the senior federal employees in Washington, D.C. Now, you think you can't sell that? That is a, that is a gold mine for Monaco. I'll just say quickly to WCBS TV, because they've really taken advantage of different platforms and different specialties to break off into mortgage broker, car shopper, obituaries. Why should just papers have the open? Obits. We can do obits. So, uh, paid obits on their website. Uh, let's go back to mortgage broker. Gee, why don't we just be a mortgage broker here? We can make some serious money. So now there's WCBS TV real estate. It's free to users, so they can compete with Craigslist. It has a graphical user interface, which is, uh, 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 they, they think, quite superior to Craigslist, because you can actually go in and maps and different kinds of visual aids. <coughs> and CBS gets the revenue from the transactions because they form their own licensed mortgage broker. So suddenly, they get paid. <laughs> Slant never thought of that. Um, but CBS actually gets revenue. They get a percentage of the sales that go through their website. So, uh, Randy, I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Uh, what might each uh, newsroom have that is readily at hand, uh, like federal office workers in Washington, uh, real estate, uh, a specific industry, uh, education, uh, for San Diego? A lot of you know that San Diego's become a, a really interesting case study in new media uh, and old media. Uh, and they do a great deal of uh, specific micro local news, but micro local as San Diego as a recreation area, San Diego as a military base, San Diego as a destination for people coming from around the country. And so they're trying to capture uh, uh, a local news uh, uh, audience through focusing on what people are doing in San Diego. Fascinating. Microlocal, I should really leave to uh, my colleague David Lesfold, who's been studying Ann Arbor and Quincy and uh, other areas where there are microlocal websites that are breaking even or better. Now, you have to be pretty ruthless about, uh, about your, your uh, cost. You can't, uh, uh, this is, you're not talking about something that has a 200-person you know, newsroom. We're talking about uh, something that has maybe a two- or three-person newsroom and lots of streamers. Um, so I'll leave that to David. Um, last point. Some of these new partners uh, may also be competitors. Uh, Facebook, barrier to entry, very low, so you sort of have to be careful how you use Facebook as, as a promotion. And then, as you saw this week in the New York Times, something which has been bubbling along for the last month very quietly, is now sort of out in the open, YouTube and local news. And if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's called YouTube News Near You. And what happens is you log on to News Near You, and the software detects where you are and starts sending you videos of news closest to where you are sitting. And uh, a month ago, they started signing up newsrooms around, uh, around the country as uh, uh, video providing partners. Now, you think this through. Is this a good idea or not if you're a newsroom? Do you give away your video to YouTube in exchange for, as they say, free hosting, or, you know, um, in, exchange, in exchange for detailed demographic analyses of the individuals who are coming in to look at your videos. But well, news near you is sort of snuggling up close to the users at that point. Um, uh, so it would be interesting to see how this plays out, but I think it will play out very quickly. Because remember what Craigslist did, uh, and YouTube News may have a similar effect on video that uh, Craigslist had. Uh, so, uh, on that cheerful note, uh, we'd love to make this more interactive because uh, no one really knows the future uh, except that uh, we can't predict it. So, uh, I would say, as Dan Gilmore said, uh, my, uh, my readers know more than I do. You know more than I do. So, uh, uh, Jeff Baum has just picked up a wireless mic and is going to do the Phil Donahue thing and run around the room. So, so please, questions, comments, hands. Well done. Well, the last item you mentioned, YouTube, YouTube local news. Uh, there may be loss of revenue, but uh, there can be business model.
and uh, money can be made from there. So it's a very good idea. Well, the question is who's going to get the money. I think Google is going to drive uh, uh, a lot of interesting advertising. You talk about targeted ads. They now know exactly where the users are. They know what their preferences are. They know what kinds of videos they're pulling up. Uh, gee, you like that uh, uh, video of that local fire down the street? Uh, you know, Amazon's having a sale on fire extinguishers if you, you know, if you buy in the next five minutes. Uh, and in your area, oh, you know, there's a, a place uh, down the street. The, the opportunities of the revenue are, are, are very high for Google. Uh, the question is what happens when uh, Google is using, or YouTube is using all this video from uh, local newsrooms. Uh, uh, what's the compensation for the newsroom? And I think that's, uh, uh, that's a negotiation with uh, people. Need, because otherwise, you wind up it's like the old joke in the, what, the clothing business where, uh, yes, we lose money on every suit, but we make it up in volume. Uh, so, that Adam, could you talk about the shift in um, editorial with the shift in delivery mechanism of news? Uh, well, the, the main shift in editorial is uh, that people don't, uh, less and less people are watching a, a program. Uh, if you're watching Women in the News, you're, you're probably dropping in and out. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's more like a newspaper. I mean, no one sits with a newspaper and starts up here at the top of you know, column one on page one and <coughs> one reads all the way through the newspaper page. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, so it's getting more like a newspaper. People are picking and choosing, and, and the, the YouTube news near you is sort of the latest iteration of this. They'll, they'll give you they'll give you a stream of videos. We're going to give you a bunch of videos, and you can sort of pick what you what you like. Uh, how that plays out uh, in terms of uh, informed populism and democratic values, uh, uh, we'll see. Maybe we're going back to the golden age of pamphleteers, going back to the 17th, 18th century. Uh, yes, um, my question is, is sort of related to that. Um, I'm interested in these two and three person newsrooms and the stringers. And it makes me wonder if what we're getting on some of these new websites is basically the equivalent of sort of the old community newspaper that had a real lot of advertising in it and a little bit of maybe sort of news around it put together by, a, uh, you know, one person. Um, so, I mean, are these really news sites, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, I should sort of, uh, uh, they say you will balance my time to uh, the gentleman from uh, Los Angeles. Because David has been studying exactly that, what, uh, what the content is on these on my political sites. The, the ones that he has selected, uh, thinking particularly of Ann Arbor and Quincy, where, where Ann Arbor, where the newspaper uh, closed, I guess, last month, uh, the Econ Paper newspaper. Uh, it, those are examples of, uh, of what traditional journalists, I think, would say are serious efforts. Lots of advertising, I don't know. Uh, David, I don't think we'd say lots of advertising, but it, it, at least in some cases, enough advertising to support uh, uh, a couple of people at the uh, uh, stream. We're going to do one more question, then we're going to turn to David, and then we're going to open it up to um, a dialogue among the group. But, but before we take the, the last question for Adam, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, arrival of our Dean, Ernest Wilson, and the Director of our Journalism School, Geneva Overholzer. Yeah, Adam, I, I wanted you just to react to a, a, a small quote today in the Metro, the free uh, newspaper. And, and this is a public relations manager telling AP something about the, the stopping of Twitter for a little bit yesterday. She said, I had to Google search Twitter to find out what was going on when normally my Twitter feed gives me all the breaking news I need. Now, as someone who teaches journalism and teaches public relations, I find this very threatening. And, and, and w would you react to it, please? Uh, I, I think it means a generation is learning how to write really tight, uh, <laughs> and, uh, which is good and bad, as you know. Uh, but it, 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 Twitter is like the, the extreme case. Uh, everyone's saying that we're, we're becoming more and more uh, uh, capable of sustaining attention uh, for more than seconds uh, any any issue, whether it's uh, uh, the presidency or, uh, uh, or spaghetti sauce. But, uh, but, but Twitter is just <laughs> amazing. I, I was kidding about writing tight, but if, 
that's uh, the main source of, of news for, for some people, uh, you really have to wonder. That, that, that goes beyond even just headlines. It makes a five-minute news <laughs> on the radio uh, uh, seem, like, uh, seem like the New York Times. <laughs> Thank you.